Hi guys, I'm George Dahl and welcome back to my film journal after a long hiatus. I've moved, now I'm resettled and I'm ready to get back to making videos. There have been a lot of new subscribers rolling into the channel and I felt really bad I didn't have that much new content for them, so I really had to get after it. But don't worry, I haven't been idling my time away. I've been doing a lot of research, I've been watching a lot of movies, and I have a lot of irons in the fire for new videos coming soon. Uh, one of the things I've been enjoying recently was the HBO miniseries Tokyo Vice. And I've heard a lot of people online, in conjunction with discussing this new show, they talk a lot about Ridley Scott's 1987 film Black Rain, uh, which is really good. But I don't think it is the prototypical gaijin in Japan, as I'll call it, uh, film in this sort of genre. Uh, I think people are overlooking Sidney Pollack's 1974 film, The Yakuza, starring Robert Mitchum and Takakura Ken, a movie that I think is a really interesting amalgamation of the Yakuza Iga genre and the American noir picture. Uh, I'm really excited to get talking about it. So without further ado, let's get started. The film features the great Robert Mitchum as Harry Kilmer, a veteran of the Pacific Theater in World War II who has since spent his time stateside as a private eye in Southern California. He is enlisted by his old army buddy, George Tanner, to track down his kidnapped daughter, who has fallen victim to a shady business dispute between Tanner's Tokyo-based shipping enterprise and the legendary Japanese crime syndicate, the Yakuza. Kilmer's familiarity with Japanese culture and unique connection to its underworld stem from his post-war relationship to a widowed Japanese woman named Aiko Tanaka, played by actress Kaiko Kishi. Kilmer took up with Aiko after the war and cared for her in the absence of her dead husband. Upon the return of her brother, war veteran and Yakuza gangster Tanaka Ken, Harry was forced to break off his romance with Aiko and return to America. While Ken was grateful to Kilmer for caring for his sister in his absence, the shame of her taking up with a victorious enemy soldier was too much to be borne by his rigid code of honor. However, Harry's charitable act all those years ago has left Ken indebted to him, a debt that Harry will now call on in pursuit of Tanner's daughter, hoping to mine Ken's past Yakuza connections for a lead. So yeah, there's a lot of backstory here to set up the movie, and I feel that it was handled better in the first draft by the Schrader brothers, but when um, Robert Town came in to rewrite the script and polish it up, he got rid of the montage at the beginning of the film, which would have seen photographs of Mitchum and Aiko together, and we would have heard some audio clips, you know, to, to kind of give us the idea of what happened. Instead, that is eschewed for a more atmospheric opening scene featuring the iconography of the Yakuza tattoos. The screenplay for the Yakuza was a team effort between two brothers, Paul and Leonard Schrader. Leonard had absconded to Japan in the mid-60s to avoid conscription into the Vietnam War. He spent some time teaching English in Tokyo, and the remainder of his hours drinking sake in bars frequented by characters from the local underworld. It was here that he became familiar with the Yakuza, the enigmatic and strikingly tattooed crime syndicate, men who are bound by a strict and ancient code of honor purportedly adopted from the ancient samurai. Yakuza stories were popularized in the Yakuza Iga genre of films in Japan from the mid-60s onward in films like Tokyo Drifter, Abashiri Prison, and Brutal Tales of Chivalry. Leonard introduced his brother to these movies, and they embarked on a script that might effectively translate the style of the Yakuza Iga for a Western audience, melding the American noir detective genre with the Japanese crime story. The screenplay was a hot commodity in Hollywood, and it precipitated a bidding war between the studios. Schrader's script work would go on to make a huge impact on 1970s filmmaking, as soon after the Yakuza was released, he would pen Taxi Driver, Rolling Thunder, and Raging Bull, and direct his own scripts for Blue Collar and Hardcore, classics, in my opinion, of the American crime genre. We're introduced to Harry Kilmer as he ruminates on his failures as a gardener. All of the plants in his sunny beach home are withered on the vine, possibly signifying Kilmer's malaise in retirement, or his inability to transition from the intrigue of the private eye world and into the domestic one. After some half-hearted protestations, Harry agrees to help out his old war pal Tanner and return to Japan. After landing, he is reunited with another veteran buddy named Oliver, and we begin to piece together a relationship that occurred between the four men during their time in post-war Japan. Oliver and Tanner have stayed behind in Tokyo, both pursuing very different paths. Oliver has integrated into the culture, living very much like a native in a traditional Japanese home adorned with artifacts, and Tanner became a wealthy business magnate whose gaudy penthouse is an American transplant. There was a fourth friend who we're told has died, but he is there in spirit through his son Dusty, played by Richard Jordan, who is employed as Tanner's bodyguard. 
Richard Jordan has a great sensibility and presence as an actor. He was very hot up-and-comer at the time and starred alongside Mitchum in The Friends of Eddie Coyle. He's got a transfixing youthful energy and his character is costumed very well. Even for the 70s, his outfits are remarkably garish with a notice me I'm hip kind of style, which puts him at odds with the more pared down low key sensibilities of Mitchum. He behaves like he dresses impulsively and with a lot of spirit. The duo post up at Oliver's house and Harry steps outside for some air, taking in all of the changes in the city. As to his eyes, Japan appears to have been westernized. Oliver then suggests to Harry that the industrial progress is merely cosmetic, and that underneath it all, it is still Japan, implying that Harry not get too comfortable amidst the Americanized trappings, because deep-seated differences still remain. Immediately after this, Dusty cuts his finger while inspecting a Japanese katana blade, insinuating that the cultures of East and West are soon to come into conflict in the story. In order to track down Ken, Harry traverses the dreamlike streets of Tokyo and arrives at Kilmer House, a neighborhood bar bearing his namesake, and reunites with Aiko for the first time in 25 years. He meets her full-grown daughter, Hanako, as well, a girl who Kilmer likely sees as a surrogate daughter of sorts. He and Aiko spend the night reminiscing before making one final plea for her affections. Obviously, it's complicated, so Harry gives up the romantic hope and gets down to business. Harry's meeting with Ken is icy and perfunctory, and Harry soon learns that Ken, like him, has been pursuing a more moderate lifestyle. He's given up the gangster life of the Yakuza, and instead teaches Kendo in the countryside. But Ken's fealty to his code of honor is strong, and he promises to help Harry and make do on his debt. The three compatriots Harry, Ken, and Dusty invade Tono's Yakuza compound, intending to smuggle out Tanner's daughter and her boyfriend at gunpoint. But of course, it goes wrong, leading Ken to take up his sword against the clan, a grievous offense for someone of his stature. Violent sequences like these might appear somewhat tame to moderate audiences, or to a viewer like myself. It's just a well-staged action sequence with great prosthetic effects. But at the time, the violence in the picture was rather shocking. Roger Ebert, in his review, noted that it's very violent, and the fact that the violence has been choreographed by a skilled director, Sidney Pollack, just makes it all the more extreme. Ken feigns satisfaction during the reunion of Tanner's rescued daughter, but we get the sense that despite his protestations, everything is not in fact fine, and Harry suspects that he might face reprisal. Ken Takakura was the most popular of Toei's Yakuza Iga stars, having appeared in over 200 Japanese films by the time he made the Yakuza with Warner Brothers. He would become even more revered in Japan as the years went by, earning the friendly moniker of Uncle Ken in his home country, suggesting a sort of paternal familiarity between himself and the audience. Sort of like a Tom Hanks of Japan, I guess. Paul Schrader was adamant that he be cast, and after the movie was filmed, constructed an elegant summation of Ken's screen persona in an article on the Yakuza Iga genre in Film Comment magazine. Of Ken, he wrote, He has a magical sense of presence, an ability to control the frame around him by poise, gesture, and expression. Unlike most Japanese actors, Takakura is a master of the understatement. He is most effective when he is silent, bowing, nodding, reacting. He speaks reticently and with great authority. Schrader was disappointed with the commercial failure of the movie, lamenting that he had hoped the movie would elevate Ken into international stardom. Though Ken did go on to appear in a few more American films, notably as the culture-wise consort to Michael Douglas in Ridley Scott's Black Rain, a film which owes a thematic debt to the Yakuza, though Ridley claims in the director's commentary that he has not seen Pollock's film. Black Rain tackles the themes of the East-West divide through the lens of the buddy cop movie, where Michael Douglas' hot-head, impulsive American cop and Ken's more stayed by the book's detective have to negotiate their cultural differences in order to take down the bad guys. They ultimately work to come to an understanding of each other. In the Yakuza, this clash of character is less evident between Ken and Harry. It's made apparent in the film that while they come from different worlds, Ken and Harry are very much alike. Outsiders, lone wolves, within their own cultures. When they confide in one another, their similarities come to bear. They are both defined by their pasts, and by one woman, Aiko. After their collision in post-war Japan, their lives have stalled. They are similarly adrift with no families, no real purpose. In his twilight years as a leading man, Mitchum took on many intriguing roles in the mid-70s, acting in transgressive, if not violent, or at least esoteric pictures, films like The Friends of Eddie Coyle, a favorite of mine, where he plays a beaten down old gangster marked for death. Farewell My Lovely is also a cool take on the Philip Marlowe character who is made popular by Mitchum's 1940s contemporary, Humphrey Bogart. While still a period movie, it's infused with a modern sensibility, and Mitchum plays Marlowe as a weather-beaten and aging private eye. 
Mitchum's career spanned over an impressive six decades, and while he sits comfortable in the pantheon of beloved Hollywood stars alongside his Western and war film co-stars like John Wayne, Gregory Peck, and Peter Fonda, somehow I feel like he's enjoyed less renown than his contemporaries in the years since his death. Maybe it's because Mitchum never cultivated the same iconic and dependable screen identity like Wayne did. He wasn't afraid to play villains in films like Cape Fear or Night of the Hunter, and he had a dark side. There's just something jaded and forlorn about his face. He has a downcast demeanor, and even as a young man, he has sleepy, roving eyes. And his lack of any immediate energy or passion could be mistaken for boredom, if not paired with the right roles. Roles like the lovelorn detective Jeff Bailey in his most iconic film, Out of the Past. Mitchum excels in these unconventional parts, whereas in like a Christmas movie like Holiday Affair from 1949, he just seems out of place, less earnest than his co-stars. Mitchum would probably opt to knock him back in a dingy bar on Christmas Eve rather than dress the holiday tree. He's just so fucking cool, you get the idea that nothing phases him, yet he's too entrenched as a standard bearer for the old guard to be thought of today in the popular consciousness as any kind of beatnik rebel like a James Dean, a Montgomery Clift, or Marlon Brando. But in the Yakuza, Mitchum had enough of an edge and physical presence to be believable blowing away gangsters with a shotgun while still summoning enough warmth to be believable as a lover to Aiko, and someone who is possessed of enough loss and weariness in his face and enough years on the old odometer to convey a believable level of regret and humility to make the ultimate gesture of recompense to Tanaka Ken by the film's end. This is why he's perfectly cast in the Yakuza. He's the ideal actor to carry a film in which an American audience is transplanted into a violent detective film set mostly in Japan against a backdrop of culture and modes of criminality that would be unfamiliar and perhaps jarring to audiences of the time. And unlike many of his contemporaries, Mitchum's foray into the more modern, violent adult pictures of the 70s appear as a seamless transition. In contrast, John Wayne's work in the 1970s was arguably less successful and left the actor looking a little over the hill. Leaving aside great movies like The Cowboys and The Shootist, where Wayne plays to his age, movies like McHugh and Brannigan are sort of feeble attempts for Wayne to keep up with whatever Clint Eastwood was doing, and were far from flattering. It's difficult to see new guard Hollywood filmmakers like Pollock or Schrader ever going for Wayne as a lead in their movies. He's got too much baggage as an icon. And this isn't a knock against Wayne. His presence and screen persona are unmatched, but he's got limited range, and I feel like he'd be less game to play along with Hollywood new wave filmmakers. Still, Sidney Pollack made a note in the director's commentary that he got the idea that Mitchum was a man who was embarrassed to be an actor, and sometimes stubborn, needing to be heavily goaded into moments of vulnerability. He also noted that he was a hard-drinking, old-school kind of guy, which, what do you expect? That's all part of the package, right? I argued at the beginning of the review that the Yakuza is a film that blends American film noir conventions with the traditional beats of the Yakuza Iga picture. I'm going to use two essays written by Paul Schrader himself to illustrate this dynamic. In his essay, Notes on Film Noir, Schrader, I think, correctly casts film noir as less of a genre and more of a series of aesthetics, a feeling, or a mode, as he calls it. Whereas in his essay on the Yakuza Iga, he lays out a list of 18 elements that define the genre, claiming that every Yakuza Iga picture usually contains a handful of them, explaining that unlike American genres like the Western, the Yakuza picture was relatively new and had yet to undergo phases of reinvention or revisionism. Schrader surmises that the phenomenon of the Yakuza Iga popularity was a post-war reaction to the traditional Japanese samurai movie, a venerated tradition defined by protagonists possessing giri ninjo, translated as duty and humanity. Schrader argues that in the samurai film, these two concepts were intertwined. If a samurai followed his duty, his humanity would also be fulfilled, whereas in the Yakuza Iga, duty and humanity come at the expense of one another. One could fulfill their duty, but at the cost of their humanity, and vice versa. I would argue that in the West, our sympathies lie more with characters who forsake arbitrary duty in order to do what's right for the largest amount of humanity. But in Japanese culture, this distinction is not so simple. In the Toei film Brutal Tales of Chivalry from 1965, Takakura Ken's character returns from World War II to find that his war-ravaged village has been taken over by a cruel oyobun, Japanese for the leader of a Yakuza clan, that unduly terrorizes the townsfolk by stealing from them and extracting exorbitant protection fees. He, being the newly appointed leader of his own provincial territory after the assassination of his old master, must make the difficult decision of adhering to Giri, that being the honor that is attached to one's fealty to his oyobun, or the humanity of protecting his community, friends, and family. Brutal Tales of Chivalry adheres to many of what Schrader calls basic Yakuza Iga set pieces, and of the 18 he lists, Brutal Tales is a good example 
having 14. Number one, the protagonist comes out of prison. This is sort of a loose classification, but I would add that returning from a war, as Ken's character does, is similar in structure as a return from a sort of exile somewhere. Number two, the evil Oyabun plots to take over the clan. This is true in Brutal Tales. Number three, the evil Oyabun's henchmen bully local merchants and workmen. Number four, the gambling scene. Schrader notes that this is an important aesthetic touch and a cultural tendency of the Yakuza, as gambling houses are central to their business. Number five, a Yakuza introduces himself to a fellow gangster in a special ceremony. Putting his hand on his right knee, he extends his left hand, palm upturned, and states his name, place of birth, and clan affiliation. Number six, the revealing of the Yakuza tattoo. Number nine, the disclosure scene. The hero, the geisha, or best friend, reveals a tortured episode from the past, which serves to further tighten the web of duties and obligations. In chivalry, there is a secret sister reveal that complicates Ken's relationship to a member of his clan. Number 10, the finger-cutting scene, a signal of atonement for a great injustice. Number 13, a duel scene. Two honorable Yakuza are forced to fight each other out of duty to their Oyabun. Number 14, the redeeming or freeing of the geisha and unconsummated love. Number 15, the cemetery scene, visiting the grave of the dead. Number 16, the entreaty. The geisha entreats the protagonist not to seek revenge, but he does not heed her pleas. Number 17, the final march. The protagonist and his one or two closest friends walk down darkened streets towards the enemy compound. This generally happens after the evil Oyabun has done something so sinister that Giri must be cast aside. In Brutal Tales of Chivalry, it is after Ken's close friend is ambushed and murdered, and the newly constructed community market building is burned to the ground. Number 18, The Final Battle, a tour de force fight scene where all accumulated obligations are expiated in a grand finale of bloodletting. So then, according to Schrader's list, does the Yakuza qualify as a typical Yakuza Iga film? Well, many of the tropes are present, but they are mostly the elements that define the second and third acts of the genre. There are aesthetic details. We get the bowing scene, the tattoo reveal, gambling sequences, etc. But for the most part, the first act of the film takes on the feeling and beats of a noir detective movie. We have our forlorn, world-weary private eye, a lost love from the past, an assignment from a wealthy character who is in trouble that leads our detective hero into the underworld. Family secrets are divulged, and any business intrinsic to the first act of Yakuza film, the return to the village, the takeover of the evil Oyabun, the harassment of the villagers, etc., is not present. But after the second act, the film shifts into a Yakuza Iga. The hybridization of the genre in the movie is, I think, exemplified well in Dave Grusin's score. which flows between traditional jazzy noir themes and dramatic music with an eastern flair. After the mission is seemingly completed, Harry can't leave until he gets to the bottom of Ken's situation. He consults a friend of Ken's, who informs Harry that despite what Ken may say, he is in incredible danger, and Harry decides to stick around and help him, getting further embroiled in the vengeance that Tono is seeking against his dead men. Harry thwarts an assassination attempt at a bathhouse, but cannot protect Aiko, Hanako, and Dusty and Oliver from a Yakuza reprisal. During this battle, Dusty and Hanako are killed. This represents the point of no return in the Yakuza Iga picture, in which the villain has transgressed to the point beyond forgiveness, and Giri must be disregarded for the sake of humanity. It's curious as well to me that Ken's fealty to Giri ends in the death of people close to him, and that they are the two members of the surrogate family group that are the youngest two characters that we see a spark of affection between earlier in the film. Implying, it seems to me, that the idea of fealty to Geary and a culture that privileges honor and the paying of debts and fulfillment of obligation can only end in a mess of entanglements and bad blood that extracts its toll from the next generation, the sins of the father visited upon the son, as it were. There is also a reveal which further complicates the relationship of our hero, as it is revealed that Aiko was not in fact Ken's sister, but actually his wife, and Hanako his daughter. Yet the shame of Harry's relationship with her drove him into exile from his family. And ultimately, the long march and the final battle come to fruition as Harry and Ken assault the Yakuza compound in a spectacular action scene of gun and sword play. We also see a cemetery scene, lamenting the dead, and the unconsummated love between our hero and the quote-unquote geisha. And ultimately, Harry seeks forgiveness from Ken, and offers tribute by cutting off his finger, a powerful piece of acting by Mitchum, and a scene that really resonated with me and with filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino, whose adoration for the moment led me to watching this movie in the first place. 
every time I see Robert Mitchum cut his finger off in the, in the Yakuza, I mean, it, it actually brings me to tears. And if I'm seeing it in a movie theater and somebody laughs, I like, I hate them. I want to take them outside and whip their ass. Schrader identified the Yakuza Iga film as being the product of a post-war refiguring of the Japanese character. That the Yakuza Iga protagonist's dilemma of balancing honor and humanity mirrored the conflicting nature of an increasingly modernizing Japan, embracing global capitalism while still trying to maintain the values of the past. According to Schrader, this was an ethos and a dilemma that was perfectly encapsulated by Takakura Ken, which is why he was so popular. Schrader describes Ken as representing everything that is old, strong, and virtuous in Japan, and that he stands as a symbol against westernization and compromise. As such, he is revered by the student radicals, the far right, and the westernized but guilt-ridden sections of the middle class. The film noir was a very similar development in America, a genre that I think has less to do with post-war malaise, which is often claimed, because to me it seems reasonable to identify the late 40s and 50s with an atmosphere of optimism and success. I think personally it probably has more to do with the mass migration from rural to urban living, but nevertheless, both the Yakuza Iga and the American film noir genres are about a culture coming to terms with its character in the aftermath of World War II. And this is the first Western film in which these worlds collided. And though it was not a box office success, I would argue that it had a covert effect on popular culture. It is a film which I imagine inspired the highly influential Chris Claremont Frank Miller Wolverine in Japan limited series, in which Wolverine was reimagined as a character with a connection to the Yakuza and to Japanese culture, a lost love for a Japanese woman, a katana sword, and after that, Japanese aesthetics soon became part of the character's iconography. The movie also presages further Japanese influence on American culture, be it in the exporting and popularization of anime in the late 1980s, or films like Black Rain and Rising Sun in the 80s and 90s, movies which wrangle with the collision of East and West and the anxiety around Japan as an economic powerhouse that threatened the West, a threat which seemed very real to luminaries like Michael Crichton at the time, until Japan's economy crashed in the mid-90s, which coincidentally is when the HBO series Tokyo Vice is set, a show which I have been enjoying and would encourage you all to watch as well. The Yakuza is a really good movie, and I would argue it's an important one too, and it's one that I've returned to more than a few times. And my primary concern in talking about it on my channel, for the most part, is to get people to check it out and watch it. Um, that's why I kind of glossed over the ending a little bit as not to give away too much. But it actually encouraged me to check out more Yakuza Iga pictures, a lot of which I've become really fond of, especially ones starring an actor named Joe Shishido, uh, who has a curiously like puffy face that becomes oddly appealing the more times you watch him in films. It's, it's almost kind of magnetic. I'm talking about movies like Cruel Gun Story or Detective Bureau 2, 3, Go to Hell Bastards. Great title. A lot of these are available on Criterion Channel streaming service. And I would encourage people to check them out. They are more contemporary uh, 60s movies than a lot of the movies that Ken Takakura became famous for, which are usually set in like the early 20th century. Um, but they have kind of a mod 60s Bond thing, which I think is really cool. Uh, so this this movie, I've been watching the Yakuza. It's opened up a lot of avenues uh, for enjoyment. And it's an entryway, a gateway into a lot of these great Japanese movies of the 20th century, uh, which I think are terrific. I'm not going to say I'm an expert uh, or by any means, but uh, I've enjoyed exploring them. And I hope that you might too. So if you enjoyed this video, please check out the Yakuza. Uh, leave a comment and like. That really helps. And don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.